So now we have usually in any event uh, we wait for uh, the most attractive, scintillating, stimulating uh, part of the event as the end event. It is done because the audience keep waiting for it, and such a presentation now is going to be by Deepa Kiranji, for which we have been waiting. Most of our events have a very attractive, very engaging, very entertaining uh, presentation by Deepa Kiranji. Uh, a, a very wonderful topic of Apasmara, one of my favorite topics, has been chosen by Deepa Kiranji. We have Apasmara in Nataraja, we have Apasmara in Dakshinamurti, and uh, uh, so let us just see how Deepa Kiranji, a wonderful storyteller, is going to make us travel through the story of Abhasmara. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nagarajji. Namaskaram to everyone. Namaskaram to everyone. Uh, such an, a day of listening to so many erudite scholars, the uh, last one being Nagarajji himself and then Christian and uh, Akhilesh Mishraji. And all the others. I'm honored uh, to just be a part of this deep learning experience. Very quickly at the start, uh, I am a storyteller, storytelling artist uh, by profession, and I work with teachers on how they can tell stories and teach children through storytelling. Uh, so there is that interest uh, because of which I have explored this topic of Shiva and Apasmara, trajectory of knowledge acquisition. So let's quickly go into um, this paper. That's one of the images of the dancing Lord Shiva. And below we can clearly see, usually this creature is smaller in size. In this particular picture, we can see the creature much larger in size, right? Um, which is Apasmara the demon. What I'm trying to do here is very quickly look at the iconography, art history, archeology, span dance and music references, epistemology, references in Ayurveda, endocrinology and even in astronomical sciences that Nataraja as the entire image itself has as a reference and then move on to this interest area of mind that comes from this connection with Apasmara which is the pedagogical relevance, the notions of ignorance, uh, systems of knowledge transmission, knowledge acquisition, contextualizing ignorance and the significance in contemporary teaching. This is what I hope to quickly uh, look at in this paper. So when we think of uh, right, uh, the moment we speak of Nataraja, of course, it is the cosmic cycle of creation, preservation and destruction. It is an art form of dance that symbolizes all of this, the cosmic dance outside and the cosmic dance within us. All of this we are familiar with what An Anand Tandavam represents, just like the Rasa Mandala of Krishna, what dance represents in this context. So I'm quickly going to other um, bits and pieces that place it for us together, which is the iconography. It's associated primarily with the Chola dynasty. We find a lot of art historians like Kumaraswamy and uh, Gopinath, they speak about the Chola dynasty connection, which is the 10th century. And when we speak of Chola dynasty, there is Symbian Mahadevi, who was a grand queen. She was known to be pious, generous, and a strong patron of the arts, architecture, of the temples, and definitely of the Nataraja icon itself. The Chidambara Mahatmya, talking about that, Takarada and Makai, I quote, Lord of the dance, the symbolism has been represent, has been interpreted in classical Indian texts such as Unmai Vilakkam, Mummani Kovai, Tirukutta Darshana, and Tiruvatta Bhuvarat Puranam, dating from the 12th century. So these are the common references we have. However, there are art historians such as Padma Kaimal, who in her essay, Shiva Nataraja, Shifting Meanings of an Icon, suggests that the Nataraja icon goes back a few centuries further. I quote, by the 7th century, the hymnists, Appar, Sambandar, 
Sundarar and Manika Vasudar had sung of Chidambaram's already existing sanctity. The reference to the hymnus uh, is evident even in many texts that are available and manuscripts that are available. Also, this is supported by, sorry. Also, this is supported uh, by parallel work that archeologist Sharada Srinivasan writes about in her research paper, where she also writes that archeometallurgical, iconographic and literary evidence discussed shows that the Nadraja bronze depicting Shiva's Ananda Tandava or the dance of bliss was a Pallava innovation, seventh to mid 19th century rather than the 10th century Chola. So we have art historians, archeologists who are all taking it further back through evidence uh, that it's not just uh, associated with the Chola dynasty. Now coming to this Apasmara, who is actually a dwarf demon under the foot of Nataraja. We know that Nataraja is associated with Chidambaram, the temple in Tamil Nadu, and in Tamil, Apasmara is called Muyalagan. The Tamil word is Muyalagan. In fact, there is a very popular song, uh, a Tamil song that goes, Kale Tuki Ninja. And the popular Nataraja post goes with the Bhagavatars who sing this. It is a popular song in praise of Nataraja rendered by many renowned Carnatic musicians, which was composed by Mari Muttu Pillai in the 17th, in the 18th century. And this charanam, it comes in the third charanam, is often missed out, which specifically says, Muyalagan Unnai Tuki, referring to Muyalagan, the dwarf demon under the foot of Nataraja. We also find references in dance, of course, the Nati Shastra, and this arresting image of Nataraja in 108 different poses is part of the Indian classical dance form of Bharatnatyam. Even in yoga, we find Nataraja Asana, one of the advanced poses in yoga. Uh, I'm just giving the spectrum of references that we find of Nataraja across different disciplines. Coming to the story of this creature, this creature Apasmara. The story of Apasmara, uh, as seen in the Skanda Purana, it is also found in the Tamil Kovil Puranams, the Sthala Puranams of Chidambara Temple. And the endocrinologist Shashadri in his paper mentions that the ceiling of the Shivagama Sundari shrine in the Nataraja temple complex illustrates the legend in a series of frescoes. This is the story. In the Diyodhar forest, the rishis had become arrogant with power that was gained through arduous worship and rituals. They were wreaking havoc everywhere with their drunken pride. So Shiva had to go and resolve this issue. He went there as a handsome Dikshatana, a mendicant, and took along with him Vishnu in the form of Mohini. First, the rishis were smitten by Mohini's beauty, and the wives of the rishis were enchanted by the Dikshatana. On returning to their senses and realizing what had happened, the rishis were furious and angry. They sat down and they did this grand yamna, from which rose creatures like a serpent, a tiger, a lion, and the dwarf demon Apasmara. Shiva fought all of the other creatures, but Apasmara is one demon he could not kill because Apasmara is one of the rare demons, the very few demons that is blessed with unconditional immortality. A point to note that the demon of ignorance is a demon with unconditional in immortality. Shiva, therefore, could not kill Apasmara, but what he did do was ensure that under steadily placed, he placed his right foot steadily and under that remained Apasmara. At the same time, as he danced this furious cosmic dance, he raised the other leg up. And when we see Shiva's hand gestures, the mudras, very clearly, the left hand points only to the raised left foot, indicative of ignorance has to be kept in its place and the movement has to be upwards. 
not being pulled down by ignorance, which is right below. When we come to epistemology, looking at the word apasmara, the references come in Ayurveda, because in Ayurveda, it is the disease of epilepsy associated with convulsive fits, breathlessness, and many other such indicators. Bala V. Mani writes, epilepsy is defined as apasmara, apa meaning negation or loss, and smara mean recollection or consciousness. So therefore, loss of memory, loss of self-control, um, loss of control over speech, these are various indicators. This paper basically reaffirms what various Ayurvedic texts talk about, considering apasmara as a dangerous disease, which is chronic and difficult to treat. One particular study by Savarkar, which is a case study, identifies the main features of apasmara as impairment in memory or awareness, and their focus is on the physical aspect. Even though most of the times, apasmara is considered the epileptic, the epilepsy is considered a manasa roga, psychic disorder, it is not a manasa roga the paper goes on to write about. Apasmara is one of the diseases which affects both the sharira and manasa, the mental both the physical and the mental. The paper, which is a case study, goes on to show how, therefore, even physical solutions such as Shirodhara can work for this Manasaroga. I am touching on, as I mentioned, different, different disciplines and different lenses that have looked at Nadraja and Apasmara. And here is one on endocrinology. There is a paper by an endocrinologist called Shashadri, and I quote him. Mysticism surrounds the dancing form of the Nataraja, but does Nataraja dance upon an endocrine mystery? Does the demon under his feet, Apasmara, literally forgetfulness or epilepsy have an endocrine disorder? Short limbs, stocky, eye popping dwarf with possible mental retardation with a name that suggests epilepsy throws open a host of endocrine diagnosis. Referencing many big terms and words like pseudo hypothyroidism, parathyroidism, pseudo hypoparathyroidism, and cretinism, referencing all of these, Shishadri goes on in his paper to arrive at a conclusion that perhaps there is a connection between this creature, which is maybe one with an endocrine problem. He talks about how the word for epilepsy in Tamil is muyalvadi, which can be translated as what is the breadth of a hare, a rabbit or a hare, when it senses a prey. The speed of its breath, the pace at which it goes, is how the convulsions or the fits are for a person who has the muyalvadi disease, the muyalvadi disease or apasmara disease. Uh, his concluding remark is that just like the endocrine glands, which are so small and which release hormones in such minute quantities, but which can cause extreme havoc in the body, such as we know what happens with the thyroid glands. He talks about how the demon of ignorance, avidya, of the ultimate ignorance, which is the ego itself, how this ego, which is so small, can play absolute havoc and cause convulsive fits and uncontrollable trouble for the larger system if it is not controlled and kept steady and crushed. References in recent times in the modern discipline of astronomy, exploration and understanding in collaboration with knowledge systems of ancient civilizations, including the Hindu, is prevalent. We have works of Dr. Raj Vedam, where he's talking about the moon and the 27 satellites and how this is indicative of not only the ancient knowledge of astronomy, but also understanding of mnemonics, how through stories, the knowledge is passed on orally in mnemonical processes. We also have documentaries such as Secret Life of Plants, where there's an isolated tribe called the Dogan tribe in Africa, which celebrates a festival of a satellite that moves around Sirius. They have absolute knowledge of its position, of its weight and everything, which typically is not possible with the naked eye at all. So uh, this, show, this shows that in modern times, there is a lot of research that is connecting back with uh, the knowledge systems. So here is one. The scope and understanding of the modern discipline of astronomy is expanding and accommodating various aspects that were at one time perhaps considered beyond it. Uh, here is a picture, which is in Switzerland, in CERN. And what's written below that is, Physicist Fritjof 
Kapra's coat is on the plaque there of this Tumita Nataraja, gifted by the Indian government to the European Center for Research in Particle Research, Particle Physics in Geneva. And it reads, hundreds of years ago, Indian artists created visual images of dancing Shiva in a beautiful series of bronzes. In our times, physicists have used the most advanced technology to portray the patterns of the cosmic dance. The metaphor of the cosmic dance thus unifies ancient mythology, religious art, and modern physics. I am Crawford, a professor of planetary science at University of London, also talks about the cosmic dance of Shiva as Nataraja, representing particle physics, entropy, and the dissolution of the universe. From this very interesting interdisciplinary um, aspects of Nataraja, here is a quick mention of the one other form of Shiva in which Apasmara can be seen under the foot is Dakshinamurti, the Adi Guru, the Mauna Guru, the Guru of Gurus itself. Considering that Apasmara is a demon of ignorance, it's very interesting to see that we have Dakshinamurti also, who is knowledge, the knowledge giver himself. My area of interest in the philosophical interpretations available through the lens of various scholars and the relevance of these in the context of learning and knowledge acquisition comes from the fact that I'm a performing artist, I train teachers and how we can use stories and storytelling. And I uh, imagine that Shiva, the Adi Guru, represented this approach to ignorance to the dwarf demon Apasmara to guide us in understanding the trajectory of knowledge acquisition. As a concept, this is also a reflection of the educational approach which must have existed in the Indian traditions. So this is my introspection for us as educators. First, the pedagogical relevance as it appears. In the traditional approach to pedagogy, there has been an acceptance and acknowledgement of continued existence of ignorance. Why else would we have a dwarf demon who had unconditional immortality? Of course, the destination, the goal is for each of us as individuals to move from ignorance to knowledge. But there was an acknowledgement that as a philosophical interpretation, knowledge as a Ignorance as a concept is always going to exist and it has to exist because only in the existence of ignorance can there be a value for knowledge. The process of acquisition exists. This is what the Hindu philosophy believed in and that is why they had a demon of ignorance who had unconditional immortality. Second, how can we address ignorance? Why ignorance has to exist and will always exist, we have to accept and acknowledge the existence. However, it is equally important to keep the demon under check. Otherwise, there will be absolute rain, convulsive fits, non nonsensical speech of this demon of ignorance. Third, the significance of silence in knowledge transmission. Adi Guru was also the Mauna Guru who transmitted knowledge through silence. I'll go on to explain how, what I interpret as silence for teachers and for educators. So if you look at the traditional practices uh, in, in uh, going back of our Indian traditions, how would they have acknowledged and accepted this uh, ignorance and this existence of ignorance? I see it, I see a few instances of it here. Like, let us consider how this might have integra integrated into the pedagogical practices of India. I find that the philosophical underpinnings of existence of a creature like Apasmara, who's of unconditional immortality, echoes through the educational system and through the literature. And even the associations in Ayurveda of Apasmara with loss of memory and unintelligent speech also holds metaphorical relevance. See, for example, they've always had stories, songs, rhymes, and poetry as ways of transmission of knowledge, right? This was to ensure that through clever mnemonics, complex knowledge could be orally transmitted, easily understood, and well recollected even by an ignorant listener. What else is this but giving due credence to the fact that there will be ignorance and one has to approach this ignorance in interesting solutions. Next, road memorization. The practice of road learning, Kantasta, and the method of repetition until this was arrived at was extremely important, which itself acknowledges that loss of memory is bound to happen. So might as well work on repetition, repetition, repetition. Comprehension coming after the rote memorization. The idea that it is too complex a task to be able to memorize and at the same time understand. So let us split it up 
and offer a process for the learner. So the progression chart is easier and simpler. And then comes Shanka or doubt. We find in any of our literature and the processes of learning that Shanka or doubt is always given a space. For example, in the Upanishads and the Puranas, we always find an inside listener who's representing the ignorance and the confusions of the outside active listener. And this person is asking doubts, saying things. They are having conversation with a wise person who is responding and giving them the answers or at least is engaging in dialoguing with them. This way, the doubts of the outside listener are acknowledged. And maybe the outside listener is also guided how to question, how to ask doubts, how to progress further in the direction of knowledge. A nice example would be that there are many, but just one to mention here would be of Garuda placing his doubts about Lord Vishnu before Kaag Bhushandi in one of the sections of Tulsi Das Ramayana. Uh, from doubt, we move to how, now that we know that there is ignorance, it is the responsibility to generate curiosity. It is the responsibility of the educator, of the teacher, of the knowledge giver, of the one who's transmitting this learning to generate curiosity. So let's take the example of the traditional storytellers. They often generated curiosity about the story that they are just going to narrate, which typically means that they are not assuming that the audience already has knowledge about the story or the storyteller. Neither are they assuming that the audience has the capacity to be interested. So they take it on as their task, which is also why we have one category of listeners, which is called the Adhamadikari, which is supposed to be the lowest level. They need to be given entertainment. They need to be guided in the direction of the story. And here also, they are not judged for being the lowest level. It is just information for the storyteller or the knowledge giver. An acknowledgement and acceptance of the ignorance and taking it as our responsibility to offer the curiosity. Next, Next, how can all this be of any significance for us as contemporary educationalists? Um, one, I would see is that acknowledging ignorance of the learner today as educators, one simple way would be creating safe environment for asking doubts. Evident as it appears, we will often find that uh, students hesitate to ask doubts. Even we probably have memories of, shall I ask this, shall I not, shall I ask this, shall I not? right? Um, but if we are creating a space where the student is not embarrassed for asking a doubt, not judged for asking a doubt, and we understand that there could be different reasons why they did not understand, maybe their approach to learning is different from our approach to teaching, then we are offering a safe space, generating curiosity for the subject so they know that they do not know. Just like the a uh, storyteller would approach the Adhamadikari listeners, I believe that it's equally important for us to offer metacognition, to make the student aware that they are not aware. If they don't know about a subject and they don't know it exists and they don't know the possibilities there, how are they going to be interested? So to acknowledge that ignorance and take it as our responsibility to generate the curiosity even before we engage in the learning of that subject would be our responsibility. Next, acknowledging one's own ignorance as a teacher. As a teacher, we ourselves are ignorant about many things. For example, the situation of a child. The child could come from a family of first generation learners. The child could have had a personal tragedy at home. It is not possible for us to always be aware of all of these. So some way to be able to at least be aware that we are not aware, to be aware of our own ignorance of the child's situation would be very valuable for a teacher. Acknowledging one's ignorance of the physical situations in an intellectual pursuit. This would have happened to many of you or to your friends or relatives where you know there is a child who does not, cannot see the blackboard clearly and therefore has not been writing notes properly. And inevitably the teacher is angry, the teacher is scolding that you're being lazy, you're shirking work, you're being irresponsible when actually there was a physical problem in an intellectual pursuit just like in the Ayurveda, they spoke about it. So just to acknowledge that there could be physical problems also in this intellectual pursuit, and we might be ignorant of it is another uh, important relevance for us. One's own lack of complete knowledge. Lastly, 
a, a, a significant reminder that we as teachers are surrounded by those who know much lesser than us. So it's very easy to get carried away that we know it all. To constantly remind that we have to be co-learners in the process and not assume that we know entirely the subject and we know it all in the right manner is what Apasmara and the existence of Apasmara could teach us, I believe. Next, continuing the relevance for us, keeping ignorance under check. Uh, today, we are in a slightly dangerous space where it's very common to uh, be extra careful and extra nice to the child, be extra polite. I, I agree these are valuable to an extent that we do not point out their flaws to an extent where mechanical appreciation has become a practice, to an extent where sometimes zero criticism is practiced, I would say that that is a slightly dangerous phase. One has to find a balance between pointing out squarely in the face what is the ignorance of the child and what has to be worked on, because that is why Shiva placed the foot steadily on Apasmara, so Apasmara would not be chaotically in control. We really need to do that as well. While we give space for the ignorance, at the same time, we have to balance out with calling out ignorance in the face where it needs to be done. Lastly, silence. Uh, how do I uh, look at silence? I look at silence as it's only when we are silent that there isn't the noise in the head, that there is silence in the head, that the head becomes empty and receptive. As educators, if we are receptive, if that's when we can quietly observe what is happening around with all of our senses, that is when we can listen, we can watch, we can receive the child with an empty and open mind and perhaps become aware of many different things which we otherwise may not have been. Lastly, through this process, we would be able to better perceived, perceive what is it that the child needs? How are they receiving what we are trying to offer or whatever the knowledge is available for them? How are they receiving it? How are they responding to it? Silence is very helpful for a teacher. We always see our role as a very productive role, but I do believe that being silent in terms of the noise in our head can be very valuable, um, which is a learning from Apasmara who was all about nonsensical speech. Lastly, like Dakshina Murti, the Adi Guru, Mauna Guru, silence can be a powerful tool in more ways, seen metaphorically, we can receive when we are silent, when we are not filled with our thoughts. We can receive as much with our heart. As this paper comes to its conclusion, it seems apt to end with a philosophical interpretation of Apasmara Purusha, the demon of spiritual ignorance, who resides within this city of seven gates, this body. I'm reminded of one of the parables on Vedanta narrated by Swami Sarvapriyananda of Ramakrishna Mission, and I end with this one. A dhobi once went down to the riverside with his donkey and his entire bundle of clothes on his back. He took off the clothes and he was about to go to the river to wash when he remembered, oh, I forgot to bring the rope and home is far away, what to do? He saw a wise man nearby and asked him for advice and the wise man said, just go through the entire motions, pretend to tie the rope around the donkey. And the dhobi did that. He went away, washed the clothes, came back, and the donkey was standing there as if it had been tied by a real rope. Happily, he put all the clothes, the bundle, tied it, and then pushed his donkey onwards, but it would not move. Once again, the confused Dobi went back to the wise man and said, what do I do? Now my donkey is not coming home. And the wise man said, do the same thing. Go through the motions. Pretend to untie the rope. And so the Dobi did that. He pretended to untie the rope from around the donkey's neck, around the tree. And as he said, the donkey happily came along with him. This, they say, is the true role of a guru. We stay bound in the ideas of bandha and moksha while the guru <laughs> plays around with our own knowledge. While some of us are fortunate to receive the guidance of a guru in this journey of spiritual seeking, for the rest of us, an oft-suggested antidote to play back with this demon of ignorance, with Apasmara, Apasmara, who makes us forget the true nature of the self, who makes us imagine that we are bound, who takes us away from remembering, from smarana. The antidote often given is smarana and namasmarana. I'm remembering my father, my grandfather, 
who we call ram ram tata because he always said ram 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 <laughs> and i end with a few lines from a song composed by surdas in which the bhakti poet talks about how easily we get drawn into the transient world and lose the memory of our true selves and then we realize it is too late when we should have spent a lifetime remembering taking the name namaskaram हे मन मूरख जन्म यह संसार कुल से मर का सुंदर देख लुभायो चाखन लागे आयो रे मन मूरख possibility for us to learn about the trajectory of knowledge and acquisition thank you so much thank you very much